The ISP series is back, and today we're taking the next step in building out our retro dial-up ISP. We're looking at a technology called RADIUS, an access control protocol critical to ISPs in the 90s, and one that's still being used today. We talked to Brian Lloyd about how RADIUS was born out of frustrating necessity, and with any luck, get it up and running on the Portmaster for the serial port ISP. In the early to mid 90s, there was an insatiable demand for users getting online, which led to a boom of both walled garden online services like CompuServe, Prodigy, and AOL, as well as the small and scrappy independent ISPs. The frenzy of thousands of ISPs popping up created an entire industry to feed them with modems and all of the other supporting gear that they needed. But one of the most critical pieces was the choice of a terminal server. And no matter which one an ISP would pick, they would need to implement some form of access control for dial-in users, or what came to be called authentication, authorization, and accounting, or AAA. An early ISP such as ours would have started off handling user authentication with simple user entries in a text file, or as local users on a Unix machine such as the SunSpark Classic. But as an ISP grew, it would scale by using multiple terminal servers connected to banks of modems. And as we heard from Pete Ashdown in our first episode, running an ISP during this time was incredibly expensive, not just from an equipment standpoint, but the operating costs could be sky high. And so back in this era, it was extremely common to see ISPs across the US, both national and local, charged by the hour, or even put in place time quotas for their users in order to make enough money to continue operating. All of this created a new problem though. Validating, managing, and tracking user accounts grew increasingly problematic and complex. During this time, some terminal server manufacturers met this need by offering their own proprietary systems for AAA. Cisco's TAC Axe dates all the way back to 1984, where it was used on ARPANET, and the increasing prevalence of these proprietary solutions meant that interoperability was slim to non-existent. Brian Lloyd, who we first heard from in episode 4, saw and experienced these issues firsthand. Well, one of the problems was there was no centralized authentication uh, capability. So I called a birds of a feather uh, meeting at Interop. And I think this was Interop 92 or maybe Interop 93. But we got all the terminal server vendors, you know, Zyplex, Cisco, uh, Livingston, Telebit. You know, we're getting all these guys in. And so we had Boff. And it was like, look, guys, we need a centralized authentication server. And one of the key trends that was emerging around early internet development was this idea of open standardized protocols instead of the more proprietary vendor specific ones from like IBM or DEC. And so there was a growing appetite for an open solution for AAA. Well, Cisco stands up and says, TACX, TACX, we're gonna use, everybody's gonna use TACX, which was the original authentication protocol developed for the ARPANET. And then Zyplex had their own thing, all the rest of it. And so two hours of trying, the vendors being unmoving, they, they just said, no, no, we've already got a solution. We don't need a new solution. You just need to adopt our protocol. And we were very, very frustrated. So finally, after two hours, we pretty much gave up. And as the vendors file up, I'm sitting there and up walks Steve Willems. And he said, what do you want to do? And walked up to the whiteboard and we started working on a protocol. Steve Willens was the CEO and co-founder of Livingston Enterprises, makers of the Portmaster Terminal Servers. Willens took their idea from Interop and developed it into a fully-fledged protocol that would be called RADIUS, which stood for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. The idea of RADIUS was to centralize authentication, authorization, and accounting for users, or in other words, help infrastructure answer three questions. Who are you, which is the authentication piece? What services am I allowed to give you, which is authorization? And what did you do with my services while you were using them, which is the accounting part. When an ISP expanded from more than one terminal server, they would have to figure out a way to synchronize AAA data, like username and password values, time spent logged in, and so on between the terminal servers. 
This led to confusing and complex scripts that attempted to automate the process. RADIUS provides a standardized way of handling this information. The RADIUS protocol uses UDP to transfer packets that are made up of four header sections and a payload supporting over 50 attribute value pairs. The header consists first of a code, which defines what type of RADIUS message is being sent, like access request, for example. Then an identifier, which helps with threading and linking of requests and replies, a length value, which is just the length of the packet itself, and finally, the authenticator, which contains values that allow the RADIUS server to verify identity of the server requesting access and to decrypt passwords sent in the payload. And the payload contains attribute and value pairs like username, password, and many other attributes like session time and so on. And at least in an ISP, there is typically a server running RADIUS software, which we'll talk about shortly, that responds to RADIUS requests. So for example, when a user connects to an ISP, it would trigger a RADIUS request from the terminal server that the user connected to. The request itself would have the access request code in the header of the UDP packet, and some attribute value pairs in the payload like username and password. The RADIUS server would then respond with approval or rejection of the request after accessing the user records in a database. So if you've used all 10 hours of your allowed ISP access for this month, you're out of luck. Livingston's new RADIUS protocol would have one of its first implementations at MishNet. MishNet was a regional network and ISP in Michigan that was connected to the wider NSF net. It was operated by nonprofit Merit Network Incorporated. And in the late 1980s, they needed to convert MishNet from a proprietary network protocol to IP and transition to standard commercially available terminal server equipment. They awarded a contract to Livingston for Portmaster hardware, as well as their newly developed RADIUS server. Using RADIUS as a base foundation, Merit Network then expanded upon it and built their own RADIUS server with more features. And in March of 1993, Willens presented a RADIUS at the 26th IETF meeting in Columbus, Ohio. The RADIUS protocol would then become an internet draft at next year's meeting in Seattle, kickstarting its route to becoming an official IETF standard. Carl Rigney of Livingston described RADIUS as being deliberately designed to be simple and extensible, meaning the protocol could be easily expanded upon in later versions. RADIUS was open source from the start, so while it was making its way through the standards process, it was rapidly adopted, especially in the ISP and terminal server industries. And in January of 1997, the initial RADIUS RFC was issued by the IETF, with the latest version in RFC 2865, which was released in June of 2000. But that wasn't the end of the story for RADIUS. RADIUS has continued to grow and evolve over the years, and is still in use today for lots of modern technologies. Modern enterprise Wi-Fi solutions make extensive use of the RADIUS protocol, which, when used with 802.1x, provides port-based network access control. And it integrates seamlessly with backend systems like LDAP, Active Directory, and multi-factor authentication services. While RADIUS has been a huge success story, we wanted to go back to its roots, helping manage dial-up user access and our Portmaster-fueled ISP is the perfect place to do that. We started out by searching for the earliest version of RADIUS we could find, which ended up being version 1.16. The install file shows this is dated January of 1995, so a few years after RADIUS was first introduced with MishNet. We're going to see if we can install it on a modern Linux host. We're working on our Ubuntu 22 lab machine with no serious expectations of getting this now three decade old software actually working. After creating a RADIUS user and extracting the tarball, let's take another look at the install file. It looks like we'll first need to add these RADIUS ports to our Etsy services file. and then make the directories for the RADIUS database and accounting files. Now we populate our ADDB data, copying the example clients and user files.
And here's the client's file. We're adding localhost as a first test to query radius from. And looking at the user's file, it has some predefined users with different configuration examples. So let's try out the Steve user to start with. We try to compile the code, but we get this error of undefined reference to crypt. We then found we can add dash L crypt to libs in the make file to fix that. We now have radius D, but there's not much helpful info from the command line. We can run it with dash X though to keep the process in the foreground and get debug output. Radius comes with this rad pass command for changing user passwords. So we want to use that to test the radius server. What happens at first though, is that while the server receives the request, it just hangs and the client itself is stuck. After looking at the code, we found the radrecv or receive function receives the request and passes it to radrespond, where we can see the pass change macro must be defined for the password change request to be called. Oddly, pass change was not defined, so we added it to the make file and then rebuilt and restarted the radius server. After verifying the existing password, a second attempt of rad pass seems to be successful. However, note the warning about received invalid reply digest from server. So now let's log into the portmaster. Referring again to the instructions, it tells us the commands to set the authentication server and shared secret. We'll set security on and then reset all ports and save. Now let's add a host entry for the portmaster and define it in the client's file. And with that, the Radius server should now be ready. We can see the request come in, but the password is empty and the request is rejected. After entering the correct test password, we see the password field is now populated, but we're still getting a reject. We made several attempts to fix this, including disabling CHAP authentication, but it looks like we're stuck with some sort of password issue. To try to determine if the problem was with our portmaster or radius server, we added some more debugging to radius D and tested with a rad test command from a modern version of free radius, which we'll look at shortly. From our debugging output, it looks like there's a problem decrypting the password received, and the client shows reply verification failed, so there seems to be some cryptography problem the Radius server is having on our modern Linux environment. Taking a break from Livingston's original Radius server, we decided to explore some alternatives, and there were many to choose from. 
Funk Software's steel belted radius and CryptoCard's Easy Radius were early offshoots of Livingston's Radius 2.0 server intended to support more platforms like Windows NT. And then there was Cistron Radius, which was an early GPL open source alternative that soon spawned an offshoot called Free Radius. Started in 1999, Free Radius is the most popular open source Radius server today. It has a plethora of backend database options, and for us, we thought that storing our data in a SQL database would be a fun option to use with our retro ISP, although not strictly authentic to the 1990s time period. Free Radius is available as a package, so we installed it on a Debian 12 machine here at the lab, along with MariaDB for our database. Once installed, we populated the database with the MySQL schema. And then we updated the default free radius configuration to enable the SQL module. We set up a user and a radius client by hand in the database to get up and running. From there, it was simply a matter of launching free radius and dialing in to the portmaster. With the debug option on, we get a ton of info, but we do see a successful authorization and an access accept response. With free radius configured and working, what are we going to do with it now? Well, we've opened our new ISP portal to our Patreon members, complete with full radius accounting data authorization logs, and the ability to create your own Radius user accounts for ISP access. We'll be building this out in the coming months, so please consider supporting our mission if you're interested in getting hands-on with Radius. Radius was yet another supporting technology that was critical for enabling the 1990s internet revolution. And just like back then, with Radius, we've now centralized our user access control and prepared the ISP for future expansion. Speaking of which, we'll soon be exploring 56K technology and making the leap into the world of digital modems. And we've got loads of other content in the pipeline. So until then, thanks for watching The Serial Port, and we'll see you next time.